So we can look forward to internal combustion engines in Formula One for the foreseeable future, certainly post-2020. You're playing a, a big part in shaping the technical and sporting regulations for that era. Uh, we're sort of having a little bit of an, an hors d'oeuvre for that this year. How, how useful is it going to be in terms of onward research for post-2020, these new front wings, and seeing how well they work? Well, with 2021, we're trying to take a much more holistic approach to, to everything. The, the aerodynamics is, I guess, the major part of it, but uh, believe me, it's not, not everything. You know, we really are looking at cost control. We're looking at some standardization of parts that really don't become performance differentiators. But on the aerodynamic side, uh, I've got a group working for me now who are really looking in, in detail at the design of the cars purely to improve the wake and to allow cars behind the leading car to still have good performance. Now, it's never going to be perfect. You, know, you, you can't change the laws of physics, but we've made massive improvements from, from where we've been. Now, along the way, um, we established a few sort of um, ground rules of how we thought we, we needed to do this. And it became obvious that it was possible to do something for 2019 in simplifying the, the, the front wings. Now, relative to what we're doing for 2021, it's, it's quite small. Um, but what you've got to remember is we're not just looking at the status quo. Formula One develops at an alarming rate. It's relentless. So if we had not done anything, the 2019 cars would have been even harder to follow than the 2018 cars were. So what I think we've done is we've pegged it back a bit. We've improved on where we were, I think, in 2018. Uh, we'll have to see when we, we get the results out. So you know, don't expect a transformational change, but believe me, it would have only got worse. And what we've done is we've at least maintained the status quo, and I, I suspect actually improved things a little bit. I suppose it's a little bit like the millennium bug in that people never actually saw the consequences of what would have happened if, if you... If, if people hadn't taken action in a very rigorous way. I mean, we've, we've had people like, for instance, Helmut Marko saying that it's cost Red Bull in the region of 15 million euros to put the new front wing on the car, and what good does it do? Is that your response to him to say, well, actually, you know, it, it, it might not make much of an enormous improvement, but it's like we've actually headed off a lot of the negative consequences? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very hard putting numbers on these sort of things. You know, 15 million is probably more than when I was at Williams, we didn't spend 15 million on front wings in the, in the entire season. So, you know, you, you can spend what, you, what you've got to spend. Uh, the fact is that the, the front wings were getting incredibly complex, you know, enormous number of parts, not just the parts that you see on, on the car itself, but also all the tooling that's associated with it. Thousands of components uh, of tooling and jigs and fixtures. So the, the finished product, you know, is actually going to be a cheaper front wing. That's a fact because it has less parts on it. Now, you do have to spend some money for change. It's a fact. So if Red Bull were planning to carry over their front wing, yes, they, they have made the old front wings obs obsolete. So that costs money. But Red Bull aren't the sort of team that would carry over a front wing anyway. You might go to race one, perhaps with a few spares that were from the previous year. But by the time you're at race three, you know, everything's new anyway. So I, I think it's a slightly disingenuous figure. Um, you know, they, they would be spending a lot of money on front wings. What we've done, if you look at it over the year, I, I suspect their, their final bill on front wing components will be less. Uh, and the amount of money they spend on research will be exactly the same. They might even have been considering d designing a whole new car anyway for 19, so you know, that's, some, that's something we don't know, do we? Exactly. <laughs> what, what's your take on the quote that's been circulating this week from Franz Toss saying that we should just cut downforce levels by 50%? Does is, is that sort of strike you as something that's doable, worthy, or is it just someone throwing an idea out there that's a little bit like saying, well, let's increase mechanical grip? It doesn't really fly. Well, it's certainly doable. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if, uh, often when you're, you're trying to get your head around an argument, you should take things to an extreme and see what answer you get. And if you take it to the extreme of having no downforce, 
then you'd say, well, that's got to be better because you can't lose something that isn't there. So th there's some logic in the argument. Um, however, it's much more complex than that. And you could produce a car with half the downforce of a Formula One, current Formula One car, but with much, much worse weight characteristics. It, it would be very, all too easy to do. Uh, and then you'd be no better off than you are now. So I, I don't hang on to the fact that we've got to have huge levels of downforce. I want the cars to be quick, but I want them to be spectacular. And in actual fact, if they're, if they're really nailed to the ground, I don't think they are particularly spectacular. Uh, to me, a rally car is spectacular. You know, that, that's something where you see the thing is absolutely on the edge of stability. It looks difficult to drive. It is difficult to drive. A Formula One car doesn't always look too difficult to drive. And particularly at the moment where we've got this situation where the teams are strategically running at below maximum performance in order to reduce the number of pit stops that they do, then, you know, the cars look anything but spectacular.